Welcome to the webinar where we're excited today to introduce cutting edge research for distribution and warehouse operations in the context of next generation metrics and emerging best practices. My name is Carolyn Lawrence and I am the Director of Corporate Development for APEX. Joining me today on the broadcast is John Brandt, CEO of the MPI Group, and Scott Gaston, Managing Director of St. Ange. We are excited that you're joining us today as we share a first look on findings from a recent MPI distribution and logistics study. Just a bit of housekeeping, this webinar is being recorded. In addition to joining over 800 registered distribution and logistics leaders online, this webinar is being broadcast live from the APEX offices in Chicago with supply chain thought leaders from organizations who work with APEX as part of our semi-annual corporate advisory meeting. For the remainder of the broadcast, those of you who are online are in listen-only mode. We have included time prior to the end of the session to answer questions. Please type your questions in the chat box located in the panel on your screen as we move through the presentation. If we're unable to answer all of the questions prior to the end of the broadcast, we will follow up with answers to all of your queries. In addition, at the end of this webinar, we will be sharing some details about a new distribution and logistics benchmarking tool that has been derived from this body of work and is now available as part of the APEX for Business platform. Finally, this presentation and link to this webinar will be sent to each of you after the broadcast. Before we get started, just a little bit about APEX. APEX is the premier professional association for supply chain management and the world's leading community for end-to-end -end supply chain excellence. We focus on working with both individuals and companies as a leading provider of research, education, and certification programs that elevate supply chain excellence, innovation, and resilience. We believe through the fostering, by fostering the advancement of the end-to-end -end supply chain that APEX improves people's lives, who ultimately improve the supply chains that improve economies and at the end of the day continue to improve lives. Critical to APEX success, is working with industry leaders and drivers to provide and promote cutting edge research. In support of this development and the development of distribution and logistics site benchmarking tool, we will highlight that, that we're going to highlight at the end of this session, APEX partnered with St. Ange, a world renowned supply chain strategy and logistics consulting firm. Joining me today from St. Ange is Scott Gaston. Scott is the managing director for St. Ange for the St. Ange company. His experience includes over 15 years working in supply chain, including five years in supply chain consulting. He has experience across multiple industries, including pharmaceutical, fast-moving consumer products, food, retail, and wholesale, including extensive project experience in distribution fulfillment center design and implementation, supply chain strategy, 3PL selection and management, global warehouse strategy, network design, Six Sigma, running POs, PMOs, and warehouse management system selection and implementation. Boy, that makes me tired just reading it. Mm -hmm. So prior to joining St. Ange, Scott worked as the Director of Physical Flows at L'Oreal as the Global Logistics Strategy and Procurement Manager at Colgate Palmolive with responsibility for global warehousing spend and in various roles within the pharmaceutical distribution at Johnson & Johnson. Scott has also worked for the Center of Supply Chain Research, where he edited a textbook on behalf of the Supply Chain Council, which covers the impact of e-business on the SCORE model. Throughout his career, Scott has led efforts in 10 countries, including the United States, Canada, Mexico, Belgium, Brazil, France, Germany, Italy, Poland, and South America. Please join me in welcoming Scott Gaston. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, just a, a few uh, topics to go over. I want to introduce you to the St. Ange Company, and then I want to talk about why we thought it was essential to, uh, to sponsor this APEX benchmarking survey. Uh, St. Ange was founded in 1983 as an independent consulting engineering company headquartered in New York, PA. We have over 120 consultants, engineers, project managers, and support serving our clients on six continents. Um, we're an independent engineering company, meaning we don't sell equipment, we don't send, sell software, we just focus on finding the right solution for our clients. We're founded within the four walls of the DC or the plant and that has expanded about 20 years ago to include many other areas of the supply chain, which include supply chain network analysis, inventory planning and management, and optimization, SNOP best practices, as well as overarching uh, supply chain assessments. Half of our engagements now are outside of the four walls. 
let's go to the next. Thank you. Let's talk a little bit about why we thought it was essential. Um, we thought this survey was more expansive than what was out there previously in the marketplace. There's a lot of studies that cover productivity and some basic metrics. But what we really liked about this opportunity was that it, it gave us a lot of key qualitative metrics that are becoming more important uh, to achieving a competitive advantage in the current supply chain landscape, including the growth and direct consumer environment. Some of the metrics we'll go through today that I, I think you'll find particularly interesting are the, the, the cycle times, which are rapidly decreasing for order fulfillment, uh, some of the human resource challenges that many folks in the phone are probably encountering today. You'll see what some of your peers are finding as well as the investments in people, processes, and systems that some of uh, your competitors and peers are making. Uh, and these are the reasons we felt the APEX supply chain benchmarking was critical to understanding where our clients need to focus to maintain or improve their competitive advantage, and we ultimately felt it necessary to sponsor the APEX effort. So with that, I'm excited to introduce John Brandt, CEO and founder of the MPI Group. John has devoted more than two decades to studying leadership in effective, purpose-driven organizations an expert on how companies can adapt themselves to the realities of new markets, new corporate structures, and new customer expectations. Brandt is an accomplished management innovator and an internationally recognized expert on manufacturing and technology. Before founding the MPI Group in 2003, John was a publisher and editor-in-chief in, of Industry Week magazine, which garnered more than 70 editorial awards for excellence and doubled its revenue under his leadership. Additionally, John served as president, publisher, and editorial director of the Chief Executive Group, publisher of Chief Executive, where his leadership transformed the magazine into one of the publishing's most surprising comebacks. He is a frequent lecturer around the globe on topics ranging from leadership and customer value to management best practices and building world-class communities. John is a recipient of the prestigious Neal Award and has served as a member of the Manufacturing Extension Partnership National Advisory Board, and a judge for the National Association of Manufacturers Awards for Workforce. Excellent. He currently serves as the co-chair of the Northeast Ohio Product Innovation Initiative, is an advisory board member of both SupplierInsight.com and Kentool Manufacturing, is a director of the Work in Northeast Ohio Council, and president of the Press Club of Cleveland. Please join me in welcoming John Brandt. Well, good afternoon or good morning, as uh, depending on the time zone you're in. Uh, Scott, thank you very much for uh, that introduction, and uh, delighted to be here with everybody. Uh, we are especially delighted to be working with uh, Apex and St. Ange on this. It is, as we as mentioned, a very important initiative, and this study was based on distribution and warehouse operations, we wanted to take a look at sort of not just, as Scott mentioned, the sort of the standard metrics out there, but taking a look at next generation metrics and taking a look at emerging practices. What I want to do is give you just a, a really quick overview of what we found. I think everybody will be interested in sort of benchmarking their own facilities against this. I've got some of that data here. As Carolyn, um, as Carol mentioned at the beginning of the uh, webcast, though, there is an opportunity with a tool that Apex has created to benchmark your facilities very specifically. So without further ado, we've got lots of great data. Let's get right to it. And this is the uh, first time this is being presented in public. So everybody on this call, you're getting the, uh, the first one. So in this study, we're going to talk first about the, who participated, because I think it's important to, for people to understand uh, where you are in terms of sort of the universe of distribution and logistics. We'll then talk about human resources, we'll talk about operations, we'll talk about supply chain and logistics, and then we will talk about assets and technology. So who participated? Well, what we, uh, we looked at a variety of demographic characteristics. And again, this is important, uh, not even so much for this presentation, but so that when you go into the Apex tool, you will be able to figure out and find somebody who look, or a group of, plan, or a group of uh, facilities that look exactly like yours. Uh, and so what we found here is what uh, people who participated, uh, roughly three quarters were privately held, which tracks pretty well with uh, standard figures out there for companies as a whole. We found that uh, most of these facilities generate sales and profit, close to uh, three quarters of them there. We also wanted to make sure that we got to a variety of industries and a variety of types of, facility, of uh, facilities. And what you can see here is this list, and I know that this, a locked PDF of this will be uh, available to anybody afterward if they want to get a copy of this presentation, so that will come out uh, you know, afterward there, <clears throat> so you can take a, a more detailed look at this. We're looking at wholesalers, distributors, retailers, manufacturers at the top there, but there is a, 
a wide array of folks who are here. So uh, in terms of who they ship to, they ship to a variety of customers, um, retailers, wholesalers, distributors, consumers, manufacturers, etc. We've had two-thirds of facilities, not surprisingly, have been open for more than 10 years. But again, I'm not going to spend tons of time on the demographic slides here. You'll be able to look at these in more detail when you get a copy of the presentation or when you go to the tool uh, at Apex afterward. In terms of sales, you know, we've got a wide variety there too. Again, less important for this particular slide, more important for when you want to conduct some benchmarking on your own and make sure you're looking at facilities that look just like yours. Now this is interesting. Most distributors uh, this year, and we did this uh, study uh, in the spring of this year, expect sales and shipment volumes to both increase. And the way this slide works, you know, the, the bottom there, the 8% or 7% is uh, they're expecting more than a 20% increase. Next is 11 to 20, 6 to 10. So you've got most distributors expecting to have a very good year this year, expecting to be very busy. They use a variety of picking approaches. This is a chart of the percentage of hours devoted to the following. Full pallet and full case, the median being 20%, the average 24. Just for everybody's benefit, if your median is sort of the, is the midpoint of all the answers that we got, of all the responses we got, the average is just what it says, an average, and can be tipped a little bit higher by when you have very large facilities or facilities that are doing something significantly different than others and with a larger uh, larger volume there. About a third of facility space is devoted to storage. The median square footage of the facilities we looked at was 30,000 square feet. The average was 112,000. So what that just tells you is that the median sort of the, if, if, there, if you were going to look at a typical facility, it would be 30,000 square feet, but it also means that we had some very, very, very large facilities in here taking that average much higher. And as you can see here, the, the median 30% for storage, 15% for shipping, 10% for receiving, et cetera. We ask uh, the number, uh, approximate uh, price per primary product SKU. And the, the uh, majority of SKUs are $100 or less. Um, the median number of SKUs handled annually is 2,250. Again, the average is uh, 63,000 because we have some very large facilities in here as well. We also ask in every study that we do, we do a lot of studies in a lot of different industries, about progress toward world class because often those folks are adopting best practices at significantly higher rates and it gives you a, a good proxy for great performance. Again, interesting here that you've only got, uh, you know, about 47% that have either fully achieved or made a significant amount of progress. And that'll be another cut that you might want to look at later when you're benchmarking. All right, let's get into human resources. What are people doing to try to manage the workforce of the future? Millennials. <clears throat> well, we found in this study that uh, more than half of employees work on the front line. At the median, it's 57%. You've got another 10% that are supervisors, management leadership. And then you can see on the, uh, on the left hand of the slide here, uh, the breakout of the number of employees. Again, this is going to be useful when you want to go benchmark a facility that looks exactly like yours. Um, at the median, we've got 12% of employees are represented by unions, and 10% are temporary employees. We talked about the picking approaches here. Just again, this is what those folks are doing. And when we take a look at some human resource performance measures, we've got some interesting stuff. The annual labor turnover rate, and the way we define that is uh, voluntary and involuntary separations as a percentage of uh, staffing levels, 11%. Absentee rate is 8%. About 41% of employees are in self-directed or empowered work teams. And the OSHA recordable incident rate at the median was 2%. And again, you're going to want to be comparing your facility to these numbers, but also then getting in and looking at uh, some, some benchmark comparables that are uh, closer to you. <clears throat> um, it was an interesting thing we find in, in this industry in that uh, a lot of training and HR practices that you see as common in other industries were scarce at a lot of facilities in this industry. 
Um, we look, you know, for example, at, at annual training hours per employee. And the, sort of the benchmark for world-class performance, if you really want to be great, is 40 hours or more per employee per year. You've got only 20% of firms in this study or in this industry that are at that level. Um, and you've got a huge chunk that are under 10 hours or under 20 hours. And that is a real opportunity for a lot of folks in this industry. When you take a look at HR practices and programs in place, you know, some standard ones, but then there's some things that you would think would be more common that aren't. You know, if you look at a formal safety and health program, only at 54% of, of the facilities we looked at. If you look at team building, only 53%. Um, leader supervisor development. These, these rates are much lower than I would anticipate and also lower than I would think would be productive for the industry or for these facilities as a whole. We ask, uh, what is, uh, describe your facility's wages? Are you lowest in market, below market, at market, or above market? Um, a third of facilities reported that they pay above market rate. So that was an interesting result here. You're, again, you're going to want to get into the tool and benchmark yourselves against it. When we look at operations, this sort of goes hand in hand with what we saw with the HR practice. There are a lot of common best practices that you would typically expect to see in facilities that just aren't happening here. Matter of fact, you know, continuous improvement is the only one that was in, in place at over half of all participants. A lot of the other ones, whether it's a daily work huddle, whether it's quality certifications, whether it's lean thinking, you know, we, we, this is an inventory business, uh, the, the adoption rates are significantly lower than you might imagine. And again, this is an issue where it is probably harming productivity and profitability at a number of firms. We ask about what types of services are these facilities performing. Um, product returns and relabeling or repackaging were the most common value-added services, but you also see um, a significant amount of light manufacturing or reverse logistics or kitting or cross-stocking as well. We got down into the weeds and looked at specific metrics as well. Um, we ask about perfect order fulfillment. And at the median, it's 91%. Order delivery in full, 92%. Delivery to the customer's original date, 92%. Uh, if we look at uh, order receipt to confirm times, you've got uh, 30 minutes at the median. Confirm to order pick time, 30 minutes. Order pick to order ship, 60 and order shipped, order received at customer, three, three days. We look at things like speed and productivity. And you can see here the lines picked per hour, that the median is 10 items, 50, cases 20, dock to stock time, that's receipt to storage time in hours, is uh, four hours. In terms of productivity, um, lost sales due to stock out, 5%, back orders, 10%, returns, 5%. Those are significant numbers and obviously are impacting productivity at these firms. We also looked at some other metrics, customer delivery lead time in days for a typical order, um, four days, total inventory turn rate. This is interesting because at the meeting it's 11, but since you've got a number of facilities that are moving things much more quickly, the average is much higher, closer to 60, 58.9 and the percentage of return product volume in terms of dollar value is 4%. Again, that is a profit leak right there. When we look at expenses, um, at the median, operating expenses as a percentage of sales are about 50%. Um, in terms of uh, cost as a percentage of that 50%, labor is 28%, direct materials 32%, and overhead is 22%. And what we found is that, in general, there was a, a big range of uh, uh, expense increases over the last 12 months. What you see is that the majority of facilities did experience uh, either an increase in expenses or a significant increase in expenses over the last year. <coughs> we also started to say, okay, we, we ran, in terms of next generation metrics, we wanted to figure out, you know, let's talk about what would happen if there was a sustained 25% demand increase? What would happen to response times? How, would it, how, would it, how long would it take a facility to respond to that? 
And what we found was interesting. At the median, it was to be 30, to 30 days to get the labor in the warehouse, 29 days for transportation, 60 days to get more warehouse space, and 61 days to get more sourced product. So this is an opportunity for firms to start doing some uh, scenario planning for the future and figure out, okay, what would happen if we did grow rapidly suddenly? In terms of supply chain and logistics, we got over uh, half of facilities delivered to 100 plus customers. And again, this is one where the median and the average are going to be significantly different just because you have some very large facilities. Got about a little under 30% at the median of goods that were imported, um, about a little under about 19% of goods that are exported. We ask, what are the criteria that you use to monitor and evaluate your suppliers? And in, they're most likely to look at timeliness, you know, lead times, on-time delivery, look at quality, either product quality or number of non-conformances, and the accuracy of the orders. Those were all well over 60%. We ask, uh, how integrated are your business systems and your operations, information technologies, uh, and, and data integrated with the following? And most supply chains and most facilities are at least somewhat integrated. And you can see here, I'll let you look at the chart, corporate offices, customers, suppliers, and transportation and logistics providers. You still have large numbers in the green there where there is no integration, and that is obviously a, a profit leak there. Uh, even in the purple, the sum integration area, that is an opportunity for improvement. We ask for method of, common, of uh, deliveries, uh, common carriers, 20% uh, contract at 17.5% at the median were the most common. Others were customer pickup, and you'll note there at the bottom you've got a median of 0% for company-owned vehicles or other. That's because the majority of folks don't do it at all, but the reason the average is higher is because you have some folks that are doing quite a bit of it. In terms of assets and technology, we ask over the last year, what percentage of your sales are you investing? And equipment and IT received the most investment attention. Facility equipment, 10% of sales invested in the last year. IT at 9%. We also looked at outbound vehicles. 20% were uh, owned th um, at the median. You can see the investment percentages for the other folks there as well. We also ask what sorts of business systems and applications are in use. The green means it's currently in use, purple means they are planning to implement it, and the yellow is that they don't have any plans to do it. So they're using a mix, uh, not surprisingly, I think warehouse management systems, mobile communications, warehouse control, EDI, demand planning at the top there. You go down to the bottom, uh, automated storage and retrieval, pick to light and put to light systems, Newer technologies, not as, uh, not as many adopted. We also ask about the Internet of Things and, internet and IoT technologies in a couple different ways. We ask about what percentage of your facility's IT systems and applications are in the cloud. It's about 30% at the median. We also then said adoption. You know, where are you at in adopting the IoT within your, uh, and IoT technologies within your facility? And what you see is you've got a large number that are a uh, uh, majority that have at least done some application. Got that, uh, it's up around 60% have done at least some. You've got 15% uh, that say they haven't done it yet, but they are uh, thinking about it. And you've got about a quarter that say you're not doing it, not planning to. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Carol. Carolyn. Thank you, John. That was some fascinating uh, information and very timely uh, in, this, um, in this current day and age. So APEX is very excited, very excited that uh, we have been participating with MPI on the collection of this data. And we're now excited to announce that we are taking this cutting edge research and analysis one step further. And we've used these details to develop a distribution of site-based logistics benchmarking tool for our corporate subscribers. 
So without inputting any of your specific data, uh, you can put in some parameters around uh, your specific uh, logistics facility or logistics uh, distribution and logistics facility, and you can get a performance-based benchmark back from a site perspective. Um, and you can look at these warehouse sites, benchmark practices, and performance metrics. So uh, as John mentioned up front, you're going to want to compare yourself to that subpopulation that looks like you. And this distribution and logistics site benchmarking tool as part of the uh, APEX affiliate program will allow you to do that. And so uh, we have put on here a link that you can go to to begin to look at what the criteria is uh, that, you can that you can use as a filtering mechanism. The um, distribution and logistics site benchmarking tool will be available uh, uh, beginning the first part of next week to our current affiliates. Um, and we're, we're very excited about the introduction of this. Um, APEX knows that the journey to supply chain excellence isn't easy. Um, and as the premier professional association for supply chain management, we provide resources like this distribution benchmarking um, and, and other techniques to transform your supply chain so that your organizations can gain this business value with bottom line and, and top line results. Uh, standard metrics and best-in-class metrics, like those presented today, play a pivotal role in creating your supply chain excellence. Um, however, we also know to gain full business value, companies need to implement not only performance improvement, but you need to be looking at uh, your, your organizational strategy, your process, uh, and, and certainly uh, your people, your talent. Um, APEX has wonderful education and credentialing programs, uh, especially specific to our certification in transportation, logistics, and distribution, and I'd be delighted to share additional information about that uh, for you. So APEX, the APEX for Business Value proposition has really integrated products and services that can be configured to uh, an unbiased, standardized, customer-centric implementation solution. And so to learn more about this, um, at the end of this um, presentation, there will be contact information. Uh, and you can certainly contact me to learn a little bit more about that. Uh, this concludes the webinar content today. Uh, we are going to now open the floor and, the, and, and your chat boxes uh, for questions. We're going to get to as many of these uh, as the time will allow. So if you want to use your, your question box to type in your questions, um, uh, I will be uh, facilitating those. Um, and John will be participating and Scott in, in answering some of those. Uh, if we don't get to everyone's questions, uh, we will provide some written answers uh, to all the registered participants for those that we can't get to. So let's get started with questions. Um, John, the first question that's come in says, if the large operations skew, uh, excuse me, if the large operations skew the average results, are those figures even relevant? Or should we not put as much credence behind the median figures? Uh, okay, so that's a, that's a two or three part question. First of all, we always like to look at the medians because the medians kind of give you sort of the typical answer. That said, the averages are useful just to, to sometimes to take a, depending on the metric. We like to put them both in there. We generally encourage people to take a look at the medians. I would say though that the real advantage here though is to look at the median and after you've gone into, for example, the tool and taken a look at facilities like yours, whether it's by industry, by uh, number of employees, etc. All right. Does the benchmarking tool benchmark public sector operations? No. I mean, yes, I'm sorry, yes it does. Okay. Oops. Oops. Can you provide, John, any examples, applications of, of IoT in, in a DC, either you or Scott? I'm going to let, since I've had two, I'm going to let Scott start that one. Sure. I'm not seeing a lot of the IoT in, in warehouses at this point. I think the more exciting thing that's happening is you look at, um, I think it was slide 37, talked about the technologies in the warehouse. You know, now they're, they're like islands of technology. I think where the, the magic's going to happen is the software is going to evolve to help orchestrate that better. It's too complex uh, for people managing the warehouse to control. Um, so I think that's kind of where the exciting exciting things going to happen in the next five years is bringing all that together and orchestrating the various technologies. 
Well, and we are, and, and, and we're seeing some manufacturing facilities that they've got where product is labeled or smart products where it can report where it is, et cetera. And so they're able to share with their supply chain, you know, customers, et cetera, internally and externally where product is, where it's being shipped. We're also, we see a lot in manufacturing where machinery is being uh, enabled with uh, intelligence that it can self-report, self-diagnose, and so you know when when a piece of equipment or is going to fail. So I think we're starting to see that, but I, I think I think we're only at the beginning. I think we're going to see some exciting stuff going forward. John, is the uh, benchmarking available at an industry-specific drill down? Yes. Okay. Or the type right. the types, I, types of customers? Yes. Yes. Yeah, and again, there are there, uh, there, there get... are there are there are there are a variety. Um, and I, Caroline, I think you're, you'll be able to send this out afterward. There are a variety of sorts and filters and criteria that you'll be able to take a look at. Correct. So the question is, will the benchmarking tool be free to APEX members? It will be free to uh, APEX affiliates and affiliate members. Um, and so if you want some additional information on what that is, that is our, that is our corporate subscription. And we will um, we'll be happy to share that with you. Will we have access to the report shown today? Yes. We, we will be sending out this deck to everyone that's registered for um, this as well as those who are participating in the room. John, what are the recent trends in logistics and transportation, oh, I'm sorry, logistics and transportation research, particularly in network design? I'm going to let Scott take that one. All right. Yeah, I want to make sure I clarify what we mean by network design. Is it, maybe we can get the person that, I mean, my right. big network, I think, number of buildings and locations. All right. Um, uh, I'm, so that's what the, I'm thinking, too, but I want to make sure it's not IT network or et cetera, yes. Yeah. Right. So, so for the person that, that submitted that question, if you'll clarify for us uh, what you mean by network design, we'll, we'll come back to that to that question. How much of the growth do you think is e-commerce driven? And what other drivers are contributing to growth, onshoring, offshoring, et cetera? I think, first of all, you've just got, you know, we've gotten used to it. We still have a very, you know, we have an economy that is, that is you know, like, like any economy that's doing well, it has fits and starts. It goes up, down, quarterly, quarterly. This is, we are, we are still in, in, a, in a recovery from 2009, and it's, this is a fairly extensive recovery. So the economy is good. That's one thing. I do think e-commerce, you're seeing what is happening to, to retailers, um, but people aren't buying any less stuff. They're just getting it in different ways. So I think the, the, the rise of e-commerce, omni-channel, et cetera, is driving a lot of this growth, as is a lot of the value-added services that a number of facilities are providing, whether it's uh, you know, repairs, et cetera, um, returns, et cetera. John, where appropriate, does the tool of your or your research define what best in class looks like, independent of the results shown here today? Uh, it does not. All right. When we're back to the ne network question, uh, Scott and John, you're mm -hmm. asking specifically about hub location design. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm with the distribution practice, so I can't speak to that. We do have folks that help people design hub and spoke systems and, and, and design those types of things, but yeah, nothing in the study on that. And yeah, and this, I, yeah, I, w I was just going to say that the, the study, we, we looked at, uh, this was facility specific. We weren't looking at networks. All right. John, it says there are a, a number of questions on what companies intend to do. Do you have any information on what changes companies have made? Uh, the, the study is extensive on the practices they're putting in right now. We don't have, uh, there's not a lot of detail on what were they doing five years ago, et cetera, so what they what have done. What this does is right. it gives us a snapshot in time of where people are, where they're adopting. What I do have is I, I can look at this data as I did with some of it, and I'm su surprised by some of the, uh, the low rates of adoption for stuff that is considered best practice in other areas. For example, there's a relatively low adoption of lean thinking and lean deployments in this industry versus not just manufacturing but healthcare, a, a variety of industries. And you would think that in an inventory-heavy industry, one that is inventory-centric, there would be more lean usage. And it's a good question as to why that's not happening. 
Uh, it could be that they believe their operations are pretty simple and they already know what's good and raw, what's good and what's not good. In reality, where we see people who have adopted this, when they start taking a look with lean tools like mapping their workflows or anal analyzing their operational data, either simply with you know spreadsheets or using big data analytics, when they start identifying wastes, they start figuring out that they're actually you they're actually leaving a lot of money on the floor, and they can improve operations, improve profitability. And uh, I will say, you know, again, it all starts with benchmarking. You know, it starts with data like this. Right. We did have a question regarding the certification that I mentioned relative to um, transportation, logistics, and distribution. Uh, that is the APIC CLTD certification, and you can find out additional information on that at uh, the APICS website at apics.org. John, do you have any data regarding ERP or, or other tools in warehouse management, uh, i.e., who is leading the uh, the segment or who is leading that 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 portion of the business? We did not ask about specific uh, software software vendors or packages. All right. There's a question about how the data provided by the participants was validated. Uh, in terms of this was a this was an online survey. He was scoped to go to specific uh, titles at specific uh, types of facilities and uh, specifically uh, in specific industries, et cetera. The data was collected, cleansed, take a look. There's a variety of tools we use to make sure that it's, uh, it's valid. But uh, if, the, if the person is asking, did we go to sites and actually observe, no, we did not. Okay. How much from the companies that participated support a make-to-order manufacturing strategy? Did we ask that question? I don't believe we, not all of them were manufacturers, so we did not, we did not ask that question. All right. And do we know how many of the respondents are adopting uh, on, to omni-channel transformation? And, and if we do, what are their main challenges? We did not ask that question. Okay. There's a lot of great. I'm, I'm loving all this because these are all great for the next survey. Yeah, this one, John, this one John and I had a, go John ahead. And I had a hard time trying to cut questions, right? So you're asking a lot of the same questions we wanted to ask, and at some point we realized we couldn't take a week of someone's time to answer the question, so it's a challenge. So like John said, I think next time we we have some overlapping questions and come up with some new ones, which may come straight from this. Right. We we do some omni-channel work, and I know Apex is very interested in omni-channel research as well. All right. Um, the last question that I have online is, do you have any information on best-in-class uh, WMS or TMS, uh, the warehouse or transportation management system? We did, uh, Scott may, may, may have a comment there. We did not ask that question. Fortunately, there's um, some, some public information. You have to pay for it as well. There's some some consulting firms that publish the best, you know, rank WMS systems. They rank by tier and, and scale and scope of the product. So you, you can, with a, with a Google search, get, get some pretty good information there. And then you might have to pay to get more detail. But, uh, yeah, that wasn't included in the scope of the survey. John, can you remind us how many companies participated in this benchmarking? Uh, I want to get the exact number here. Let me just check that. Two hundred and twenty-four. Two hundred and twenty-four. Um, another question has come in. If you have the power, can you predict what is the logistics scenario of tomorrow? Meaning uh, information, meaning automation, full usage of cloud, etc. Gee, that's a that's a that's a great question. <laughs> I think all of us would like to have that that genie hat on today. So, well, I think Scott, you're, I, I'm John, say you got you're, ideas. Go ahead, Scott. Yeah, sure. I mean. I, if some of you had asked me this question two years ago, I felt like a lot of our network analysis type projects, people were chasing Amazon, right? I want to be able to deliver everything in a day. My common joke is you don't want 15 warehouses and all the inventory that's necessary for that. Only so many right. companies can support that, right? Uh, that question seems to have died off and really a lot about automation, uh, mostly from you know, how do I support the hurdle rates, right? It doesn't usually support your usually three-year type payback, four-year payback. You're thinking more five to seven years because people are seeing, the senior executives are seeing 
news articles and videos of Amazon and robots and drones, and they kind of expect that to be in the warehouse. I don't think it's far off, but it isn't tomorrow, right, unless you're willing to invest in something that may not have the best return. Um, but I think it's going to happen rapidly, and, and one of the best examples I use is if the car companies can drive a car on the road without a person, which is much more complex than driving an AGV or LGV in a warehouse, um, the price point is going to come down for that very rapidly, uh, I, I would imagine. Um, and at that point, I think you're going to start to see it in the warehouse much more where there's fewer operators and, and a lot more things are going to be, be automated. But that's where I see all the questions. And it, it goes the gamut from anybody that's a retailer to even a fast-moving consumer goods company, which has different challenges. They might have a 3PL, so they've got to try to figure out your technology in there. So um, it, it is an exciting time. And in two to three years from now, I think it's going to be a lot more technology in the warehouse. Great. I would I would agree with that. I would agree I would agree with that um, uh, driverless drones etc. But mainly within facilities and within supply chains, mm -hmm. IoT yeah. enablement is uh, and big data is is going to drive significant changes. And in, and to Scott's point, it's going to happen so fast. We uh, we do a study on on the Internet of Things in manufacturing. We've done it uh, and we've been asking questions about it for about three years. Two and a half, three years ago, we had close to half of manufacturing executives in the U.S. said that they didn't, they had never heard of the IoT. The study we just did said that a majority of manufacturers made money with the with IoT technologies last year. This is in a two and a half year period. I think you're going to see a similar thing with IoT and other technologies within uh, distribution logistics over the next two or three years. And and the and the risk there, let's just be clear is that if you're not adopting that, if you're not taking a look at that, if you're not benchmarking, there is a real risk that the, we create a sort of a, a, a digital divide between the haves and the have-nots in supply chain and distribution and logistics. And you don't want to be on the wrong side of that equation. And to, to add to John's point, the data piece kind of triggered my mind. We do a lot with client data. And um, you know, it's surprising how challenging it can be to maintain good data and maybe more specifically, find students that graduate from undergraduate college that can deal with data, know how to deal with large quantities of data. Um, there's, a, there's a skills gap that as more and more data is produced, finding individuals that can manipulate it and make decisions based on what they're finding. All right, we do have a question, uh, John, about did we have participants from developing countries, uh, especially from uh, Africa? No. This is a this is a primarily a U.S. study. Okay, um, and uh, relative to an earlier question about uh, why distributors are so slow to implement Lean, do you have any thoughts on on why that's occurring? Why they're they're slower to implement some of the the technologies that the manufacturing companies seem to be embracing? It's a great question. I mean, I, I only have speculation at this point. Um, it's just I do think that a lot of executives sometimes in this industry tend to think that, well, this is a fairly simple business, right? We get stuff in, we, we park it, we, we store it, and then we ship it out. And they, may, and they sort of think this is the way it's done. What typically happens if they go look at other facilities or if they even go into other industries or adjacent industries and take a look at how things are doing, they may find that what they think is standard practice maybe was standard practice 10 or 20 years ago. And I just, I just think there is some reluctance there to take a look at it, and yet when people when people do take a look at it and start implementing these tools, and again, it can be lean, it can be you know the, the, any other improvement methodology. In studies we've done across a wide array of industries, in general, you if you have a meth, if you have any improvement methodology, you do better than your peers. The longer and the deeper that improvement methodology has been implemented, the better you do, and it's a fairly consistent uh, finding. Uh, across a number of industries across a number of years that we've been doing this. Um, this is an opinion question for you and for Scott. Is Amazon best in class at supply chain planning and implementation? I'll let Scott start sure. there. Sure. <laughs> I, I think, well, well let, let me talk to you about, about what I personally do, right? So anything I order on the internet, I probably check Amazon first. It's, I, a place I live in Pennsylvania, almost everything I order gets there in a day. So the execution um, is, is exceptional. And they almost, I don't think they've ever made an error. So it's one of those things that I think they're executing well. I think they're pushing the industry, meaning distribution and warehousing, to a, at an uncomfortable pace, 
right? They, they, they are looking at the big numbers, thinking about how many people they have to employ to pick and pack product and, and realize that that's a hindrance to their growth. So I think they realize that uh, automating is a, is a way for them to, to mitigate that risk. Um, I, I, you know, a lot of our clients ask us, what do they do, what do they do? And, and there's no rocket science in it. They do really, really, really good things with data, and they have solid process. Okay. I'm just going to say that there are a lot of great players out there, and I'm not going to I'm not going to make a call on that right now. Yeah, I'm not saying they're the best. I'm saying they're good at what they do. Yeah. They're very good at what they do. Is there any ratio for people working on the floor versus the amount of volume dispatched in the in the benchmark? I don't think we did that. We didn't. That is, we we did not specifically ask that. That's probably that's something we could take a few of the factors and back into or calculate. That's a technical term there, back into. I meant to calculate, but but we could approximate it. But it is, it is not, it was not directly asked in the study. But I think we could probably get to it. All right. Next question: Are there complexity information other than SKUs available as uh, available, such as the number of warehouse facilities? This was a facility specific. So th this this I want to just be clear: this was not an enterprise. We weren't looking at networks. We weren't looking at a, a series of where the, all the questions in here are for one facility. Okay. All the questions, all the answers, for that matter. John, it seems that more common carriers than contract carriers are being engaged by the companies for their transportation needs. What are the typical key reasons? Is it cost or something else? I'm going to let Scott take that one. Anyway, sorry, I was, you caught me off guard. What was the question? It says, uh, it seems that more common carry carriers and contract carriers are being engaged by companies for their transportation needs. What are the typical key reasons? Is it cost or something else? I'm trying to think what would be a good driver for that. I don't know. All right. Sorry. Sorry. It's all right. It's all right. I, we didn't, we, and, I, and I would just, I would, my guess is cost, our, our, our hypothesis is, is cost, but we didn't ask that question. Correct. Okay. All right. We do have a live audience in the room, so I do want to pause for a minute and see if anyone in our in our audience in the room has any specific questions they would like to ask uh, our panelists. Just had one. Uh, did the data indicate at all whether companies were trying to go towards a larger facility versus and more centralization versus smaller decentralized type network? Even though I know it was specifically to plant specific, uh, you know, just based on the average versus the median. Seems like they're showing something's going on there. Does the data give any kind of indication of that? John, I don't think there's anything that directly addresses that question. No, we did. Study. We did not ask that. I mean, I, I am telling you, I'm hearing all these questions, and I love them. And, and and as Scott indicated, as Scott indicated before, a lot of these are questions that we had to leave out because you know, there's a you know. At a certain point, if you ask everything you want, you're going to have the best survey ever, and the one person who completes it will will love will will give you great answers. So it's always a balance. I think I think this tells us uh, some of the stuff we need to to uh, ask in a supplement. So in our, in our business, we tend to see the larger buildings, especially on the e-com side. We're seeing a lot of those, a lot more development on that side versus in the CPG, which is a little bit more of a slower growth type of industry where people are investing, and you're you're planning for significant growth over a five-year time frame where this is a little bit scary. You're going to open a building realizing it's going to be empty. And, oh, by the way, it's going to be full by the time the five-year time frame is going to be up and then the plan for expansion beyond that. So we are seeing bigger buildings because you can put the technology around that. And there's obviously kind of a top end, how big you can make that building before it becomes difficult to manage or hard to staff. There's too many, too many people required to run it that may not be in the area to support that operation. Thank you. Any more from the room? All right, this is for uh, not only our panelists, but, but for our larger APEX team. Um, with training being somewhat lacking and workforces being stressed, how do we, as APEX instructors, convince distributors that, that they need to do more? So I, I will start with the answer to that. I think one of the things that we learned as part of this study is that there are a lot of opportunities for what John referred to as profit leaks 
um, in, in a lot of this research. And the research showed specifically where companies are bleeding money because they are either not adopting something or they haven't uh, fully adopted something. So I think as uh, training providers and, and, and um, supply chain excellence leaders, we can begin to have the conversation with warehouse and distribution managers um, about how having uh, ha helping their team understand where they may have some talent gaps um, and, and begin to provide the training to them to be able to elevate them to be able to look at things like you know where 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 do we have profits that we're not recognizing or realizing because we're ineffective or inefficient at what we're doing. Um, anybody else from the team have anything to, to add to that? I think that in addition, this is Dominic Longo, the Director for Corporate Development. I think that in addition to the profit leaks and the best practices that, that weren't being adopted, uh, having a conversation with uh, a leader in one of these organizations to talk about understanding a broader segment of the supply chain, whether it's with the CLTD curriculum beyond the four walls of the, the distribution center that you're looking at, uh, understanding the other components is going to help you relate to your specific position within the supply chain, but also relate to your clients and your customers. So really give them a, a broader view, and that's going to help them to do a better job at, at, at the specific task that they have in the supply chain today. Well, I'll chip in. We've been doing studies on this, the, you know, including asking about training in a variety of industries for a long time over years and years and years, and I will tell you that people who spend more on training and people who train more hours make more money. It's just, it's, it's, it's pretty much a straight line. All right, when talking about 3PL warehouses, which are more common links on contracts? I'm not certain what that question is asking. Sure, there, there's kind of a debate on how long you can make uh, okay. contracts, right? So. Um, I don't know exactly where the median and average lie, but it's somewhere between three and five years is what you see when people do studies of this. There's an organization that does do some studies on, on contract length. So this, this actually ties well with this document, right? So if, if you're in an arrangement with a 3PL and you're only doing a three to five year contract, it makes it difficult to implement some of the technology solutions that we've discussed here today because I can't appreciate that over a long enough period of time. Um, that's actually a challenge for the, the 3PL industry is trying to figure out how to bridge that gap and, and bring some of the technology to the table but still satisfy these contract lengths that the, that the industry desires. Uh, there are, people are always nervous to make those longer term commitments. Um, it's a shame that's just the way the industry has evolved. Um, some people mitigate it by having, you know, we take the building, we take the equipment, and, and the 3PL provider provides the expertise in managing people. It's one way to address that so you can bring some technology there. But as far as contract lengths, it's Somewhere between three and five is the average, I think, trending towards three. Okay. Well, this brings us really nicely into the next question. It says, what trends do you see in using three PLs or four PLs? Do they typically benchmark higher or lower? I will, I, you can sort down, we've, I think we had, I think we had uh, 11 three PL facilities that participated. So you can sort down to that level and uh, I will allow, allow people to take a look at the um, tool and do that. Yeah, you can you can definitely sort it that way. I guess if I was to give you any opinions or context, I mean, you, some of the best operations in the world I've seen are run by 3PLs, and some of the ones that aren't. It really comes down to, you know, how how good is the local manager and local team, um, and the solution that they're providing. It can be very site specific. Um, I mean, there's some great global providers out there. There's some great regional providers. Um, but it's a little more, it's not just specific to a company, it's also a company and who they bring and actually manage your site. All right, this is a general question, but it says, is it worth it for a small company, chemical distributor uh, in Ecuador, with approximately $800,000 a year in sales to invest in the implementation of new technologies or methodologies like lean thinking? Well, I can, without knowing more about the specific situation, I mean, it would be malpractice for me to, to say that. I will tell you, I, I don't think I've ever seen a facility that couldn't benefit from uh, an improvement methodology, whether it's lean or another. As to specific technologies, obviously, I'd need to know more about the facility. Do you think drone shipments are the future of logistics? And did you, make, did you collect any research on how many companies are using this new technology? 
We did not ask that question. I think it is inevitable that it, in some way it will be used, but I don't know. Uh, we don't know how that's all. We all don't know how that's going to look look yet. <coughs> All right, that, um, that's the last question that we have right now, unless we have any more from the room. Um, I, I do want to thank everybody for their participation today. And I do want to let you know that um, if you would like additional information, uh, either on the new benchmarking tool that, uh, that we're getting ready to uh, unveil or on the CLT certification or any of the other APEX products, please feel free to contact me directly. Um, my contact information is on the screen, and, and I will uh, share that with our corporate development team, and we'll be getting back to you. If you'd like additional information uh, on some of the benchmarking results if, uh, after you've had a chance to, to view this and you need some specifics around the data itself, uh, John, I believe you've, you've allowed your contact information to be shared. So, Absolutely. Um, uh, we will be publishing uh, a white paper around this particular study, so uh, we will have that available uh, in, the, in the near future, and we really want to thank everyone for their participation this morning. We had a very large crowd um, externally and a, and a very uh, good crowd internally, and we thank you very much for um, your participation. Any last thoughts, Scott, John? And I'm here. Not for me. Go forth and benchmark. All right. All right. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>